I want to thank you guys all for having me. Uh, my name is Calvin Hendricks Parker. I am co-founder and CTO of Six Feet Up. I'm here to talk to you today about how we can automate our infrastructure. Uh, you may have heard in that great keynote uh, that just happened a few minutes ago about some of the rules of DevOps Club and some of the reasons you may want to do this. Uh, I'm going to give a little more in-depth talk on some of those items specifically. Uh, so again, if you have questions, make sure you throw them up on the Slido or uh, raise your hand and I'll make sure Mary Beth grabs the microphone and gets it over to you so that I can make this as interactive as possible. Uh, I do only have about half, a little less than half an hour, so we'll try and get through this as fast as possible. There we go. Uh, when it comes to servers, and I, as I mentioned before, there are certain things in life that should most certainly be handcrafted. Uh, fine woodworking, jewelry. I mean, who doesn't love a fine piece of handcrafted jewelry? Uh, you know, I, everyone has something like that. And of course, my favorite handcrafted item would be beverages. I'm definitely a fan of beverages. If you've, if you've ever known me or been around me, uh, I love all kinds of coffees, you know, handcrafted uh, cocktails, uh, craft beers, whatever the case may be. These are things that most certainly should be handcrafted. But not your infrastructure. Bespoke is definitely not a word that we want to use when talking about our servers or our infrastructure that's running our applications. This should be a term reserved for clothing and not our servers that run our applications. The age of the handcrafted servers is over. You know, things like beautiful and unique snowflakes are not reproducible. I, a little bit of trivia here. The chances of a snowflake being exactly like another is one followed by one million trillion zeros. That's a one followed by 18 zeros. And the same thing is holds true for your servers. Uh, the chances of reproducing that server once you have gone in and meddled with something, uh, because it may be not you who did it, it may be somebody else who did it, is nearly impossible to reproduce uh, this use case uh, over and over again. Uh, how many people have ever run into this where a server has been running for five years in the server closet, and next thing you know, you need to redeploy the app or refresh the hardware, and you cannot get that application to run on the new hardware? Raise your hands if you guys have been in that spot. Oh yeah, this is not uncommon. Uh, and that's why we're here today, because we're going to talk about automation and orchestration. Uh, things like pets should have very cute names, because we love our pets. We want to you know, cherish them and hold them and pet them. Uh, pets you know, are unique, and we want to love them. And I said, we give them you know, funny names. You, you would never want to uh, do bad things to your pet. You know, have to just... To, to terminate your pet and spin up a new pet, right? <laughs> Unlike that, uh, cattle typically have numbers, and they help provide us with food. And uh, we don't typically think of them as having a name or a cute face. They do. Uh, but this is kind of the world of DevOps, where we want to think about our servers not as pets with cute names, but as cattle and numbers, and they can be replaced. If one gets sick, you know what? We walk her off the side, and she can uh, do, you know, retire off in the pasture over there. We don't care, because another one's going to step in and replace that nice uh, server for us and actually continue to do our work. If you have one single email server, and that email server has a cute name, you're going to work really hard to keep that server alive. But if that server just has a number, and you know if you terminate that server, the auto-scaling group just spins up another one right in its place, you don't care. The data is you know, persisted correctly in some manner that any server, any instance can spin up, any image can now take its place and be uh, in, you know, doing a fully functioning operational you know, nearly instantaneously if it's done right. So now we're in this world of DevOps, and many non-cloud uh, native applications have the ability to be deployed in a cloud native tool. So we can actually take these you know, applications that are more le legacy style and deploy them in a way that would allow us to fulfill our need of running in a more cloud-native uh, operation. So how do we take this beautiful, handcrafted, bare metal server running our application and translate into the cloud? Now, I have a couple stories about that. So I won't go over this again, because you guys just saw this, but uh, it does have to do with our rules of DevOps. There is, uh, I kind of took a little bit of this from a Hacker News post. Uh, there is a link in the presentation. The presentation is actually online in IndiePie GitHub repository. If you want to go check out the Hacker News post that kind of gave me the inspiration for this. 
there actually is another interesting take on being a welcoming DevOps club. We want to make sure that we're not just this exclusive club, kind of like it was in the, um, in the movie. You know, I want to be uh, uh, opening and, and a welcoming to all. So there's actually another link in this, in this slide, the, the uh, presenter notes, uh, to uh, Brid Bridget Kromhot's uh, post on the subject of being a welcoming DevOps team. So keep that in mind as you read through these rules. So we'll talk about the tools. Uh, we're going to talk today about a couple tools that we've used to get a couple of our projects uh, up and running. What's awesome about you know, being in the Python community is Python has many, many tools that are available to us to do this, such as SaltStack and the AWS Bot03 library. So we're going to talk a bit about Amazon Web Services and how we've automated it with uh, SaltStack and Bot03. So the main story here is going to be going from the closet to the cloud. Uh, again, I'll raise hands. How many people have actually had their servers stored in a literal closet? Yeah, we started there. Uh, I, I mean, it was, there were coats on top and the servers down below. It was literally a coat closet uh, where we had servers. This is pre-20 years ago, I think, but that's how it started, right? Uh, we did a project, though, recently with the College of Engineering at Notre Dame. And they did have a single server in a closet on the campus that we deployed for them back in 2011. Luckily for them, in 2016, the whole university-wide said, we are moving into the public cloud. So they had an initiative to get everything up into the public cloud. So the campus-wide, they needed to move all applications, no matter what they were, up into the public cloud. So this is a perfect opportunity to take an aging single server hosting their site, improve the performance, improve the resilience, and also make it uh, you know, more resilient against potential failure. So moving them up into the, the public cloud this way. What they had was a single server monolith, kind of standard, you know, the web servers on the same server as the database servers, on the same server as the proxy server, as the same server as the caching servers, the same server as the actual application that's running the code. So one single instance running everything, which means if that one single instance goes away, that was storing all the data, that was delivering all the, all the pages, uh, that had one single connection to the internet. Uh, they had terrible uptime, unfortunately. Nothing to do with the quality of what we delivered as far as the application. It's just that it was delivered in a more legacy fashion, not built cloud native. We want to take this single server monolith and move it into a more cloud native application without having to recode the whole application. We want to be able to take advantage of the services that Amazon gives you, for example, like CloudFront for a CDN. We want to be able to use an ELB, the Elastic Load Balancer, to be able to load balance across multiple application servers in case there was a failure of one of our beautiful cattle uh, that another one can just stand in in its place. It, these um, servers, the AZ1, AZ2 servers, contain zero persistent data that actually is used in the delivery of the application. They can go away at any point in time. Another one can be spun up in its place with the exact same image, and within seconds, you know, maybe under a minute, we can actually have our, our cluster back to full strength or can scale up now. We have the ability to use that uh, elastic capability of Amazon to scale up our application, even though our application was never written in this cloud-native way. Now, the data gets stored in more building blocks provided by Amazon, such tools such as EFS, their elastic file system, and then using RDS, their uh, database service, we can now have automatic replication between multiple availability zones, and then we can actually have an off-site replication to a whole other region inside of Amazon. So we have the uh, AZ1 and AZ2 all running in one region, so in two different data centers in that region, but now we have an off-site backup via the S3 backup, which can replicate globally as well over a software lifecycle or a storage lifecycle events, and now the RDS data can be replicated into the other region. So spinning up in another region is just as simple as taking our automation, running against that, and, and going live. But how do we make it repeatable? That's where our automation comes into play. Does anybody uh, go to Purdue? Who's a boiler? Go boilers. Uh, whoever went to the Rube Goldberg competition while you were at Purdue? I didn't, unfortunately. I wish I would have gone. You went? It, it would have been awesome. So this is, the, this is the Rube Goldberg cartoon that that competition is uh, named after. So we're going to basically enter into SaltStack and Bot03. How can we take and transform code into infrastructure so we can actually build and redeploy our environments as needed? We want the end goal 
of our application to be uh, reproducible and have a command and control infrastructure so that if we needed to spin up, for example, uh, another testing instance, a staging instance, or a performance instance, it's a matter of uh, telling the master. In this case, we're going to have a salt master. You can see the salt master here. And it's going to be able to spin up any n number of instances of our application into different VPCs inside that region. Or we can actually spin up another master in another region and do the same thing over in some other region. So the goal being get a control VPC up and running, and then deploy our application servers, uh, all of our cloud resources, such as the CloudFront, the ELBs, the EFS, the RDS, all the TLAs can be deployed into this system without any one single person logging into a console and clicking at any one, one bit. Because if you go back to the first rule of DevOps Club, we don't log into servers. That should almost be equally as true as we don't log into the Amazon Web Console and click around. Because uh, that could be nearly as destructive as producing a beautiful, unique server. So we have a bit of a chicken and egg problem. To get this level of automation up and running inside the cloud, we need to get SaltStack deployed someplace where it can be usable. Uh, so what we do is use just the plain, straight up Python and Bado3 library. And with a couple lines of code, you can actually create a, uh, in this case, we're creating that control VPC where we'll run our salt master. And then from there, we can uh, now launch the salt master, which will then, in turn, create all the other cloud resources for us. Because salt has the capability to build uh, AD AWS native tooling, such as the CloudFront instance, the ELBs, and then spin up the, A the um, availability zones with our EC2 instances in it. So the first thing we have to do is to actually use probably about a 40, 50 line Python script to bootstrap the whole environment. And this can be done as long as you have your API keys on your local system. This can be done from your local system without ever logging into the web console whatsoever. Oh, quick little side note. Uh, because you do have API keys, and no one wants to be the next headline on Hacker News, uh, make sure you store those keys securely, please. Uh, I do not want to see anybody having plain text versions of your keys on your laptops at any point in time. I recommend using LastPass. Uh, it's kind of a poor man's secret store. Uh, we use uh, LPath env, so it allows us to actually insert the credentials into the uh, environment for us, so as environment variables, just like this. So if I run this command from my uh, command line, it will actually go to my LastPass query for an item named AWS SFU Calvin, and then take the secret and key and put it into environment variables in this shell only. And then when I close that shell, those credentials are no longer on my system in memory. And they were never on my system on the disk, which is the most important part. Uh, so you can see here, these are obviously not real keys. You can try them. I don't know if they'll do anything. But that's what you get when you use a tool like LPASM to basically manage your secrets for you. So continuing on, uh, we will now take and build up our EC2 instance for the control. This is all about building the control VPC. I'll kind of skip over that bit. Because really what we care about is getting salt stack running. And these slides are all online for us. Uh, so if you want to check it out later, you can. SaltStack is an event-driven orchestration platform written in Python. A lot of people think it's just a, con a configuration management platform, but it actually is much more. It can react, it can watch for conditions, it can then spin up in reaction to those conditions, and it can actually do all of your orchestration. So if you actually want to be able to script all of your releases, so for example, with a zero downtime release, and you want to be able to automate and iterate over all of your application servers in a controlled fashion, ensuring that as one goes down, it's not in a load balancer. The next one comes up. You ensure that the site and pages are ready to load. SaltStack handles all those things. And one of the things that, set, one of the things that actually got me interested in SaltStack was the remote execution environment. I can now query interactively my whole cloud uh, set of resources, and SaltStack can give me back information about you know, whatever hardware is running, what hypervisors are running, uh, what applications are deployed, what versions of software are installed. I can basically interrogate the, the whole environment using salt stack, using the remote execution uh, piece. The next most powerful thing is that event-driven orchestration. If a minion, so you salt uses masters of minions, if a minion goes down, I can react to it by spinning up a replacement, or I can, you know, if I t d detect load has gone you know, too high, for example, if I'm using um, like graphene or like some kind of uh, monitoring software to watch for traffic or load on the system, I can have it react in response to that. 
Uh, it up, able to act in an agent or agentless operation. It fully supports all the cloud, major cloud operators out there. So if you're not using AWS, you're using Azure, it has built-in support for that as well. And then most important, I guess the next most importantly, is speed and scalability. It has the ability to scale across thousands of servers because it's actually using zero MQ behind the scenes. So it actually produces all the results in parallel as it deploys all your actions out to the servers. Uh, and this is kind of comparable to like a chef, uh, chef and puppet. Uh, it also incorporates orchestration pieces that you might be using Fabric for. And then tools like Terraform to do cloud, or cloud provisioning are all kind of bundled into one inside of SaltStack. Now I mentioned it can run in a masterless or with a master, but no one wants to be masterless. If you know the minions, they, they are very sad when they do not have their master uh, to be around. So we want to make sure we run, I like running with the masters of minions. Uh, that way you have happy minions. And at this point we can orchestrate. Once we have that control VPC up and running and ready to go, uh, every aspect of our infrastructure is defined via salt pillars and states. So states are kind of the template or the stamp that allows us to stamp out different functions or pieces of our infrastructure. The pillars are all the variables that we basically stuff into those stamps. So if I've got a production environment with this database username and password, and I've got a staging environment with a different username and password because I'm following best security practices, Salt can manage that and be aware of our various environments and give us just the data for that environment or the other environment. So in this case, we're running the prod state up here on top. You can see it's got a pillar env equal prod at the back. And then the second one, we can build a test environment by running the exact same command, but giving it the test environment. And it will now spin up all the infrastructure for our testing environment. So that original picture we were looking at of a prod VPC and a test VPC, you just saw the whole commands to build both those environments all the way to delivering web pages for the application. It was just those two commands for building both environments um, all at once, which is nice. And now in front of all the, the VPC bits, we get all the CloudFront ELB, and behind that we have all of our storage with our EFS and RDS. And we can take this further. So now we've built up the infrastructure and deployed our initial application, we can actually deploy code releases. Uh, I won't go too deep into that because I want to make sure we keep on time here and, and I want to respect everyone's uh, breaks. But we can go towards zero time releases, zero downtime releases. If you guys are familiar with Python, I've ever messed with the Jinja templating language, Salt Stack leverages that Jinja templating language, it allows us to do things like make loops. So we can actually loop over every app in some defined set of app servers, which can be dynamically defined out of the environment due to that remote execution. It can actually gather information and figure out what the app servers are, and then loop over each of those app servers, for example, stopping Varnish to take it out of the load balancer, uh, getting prepared for the release uh, by pulling the, the latest code uh, to, uh, well, pulling or stopping the instances, pulling the latest code to the latest uh, app server, and if you have, here's an example, pulling out the code, and there are other um, manual operations that would need to happen as part of your code release. For example, you need to run uh, Grunt or Gulp to compile your CSS and JavaScripts. Salt takes care of that as well. So no human forgets any part of the steps. We also can make sure we can have an easy way to roll back. You can also provide, in our case, we, we um, give the ability to specify a specific branch for the release. So if you actually wanted to roll back to the previous tag, you can specify that with that you know, pillar equal blah, blah, blah. Specify what branch you want to roll back to or what tag you want to roll back to or what commit you want to roll back to. And we now have a way of rolling back out of that failed release in case something went bad. And if something did go bad, Salt doesn't continue destroying our environment and trampling it uh, like any other good DevOps tool might. Salt will stop at that, that point, not put the server back into the, the load balancer. You can then at that point diagnose and debug and fix any issues that may have come up. Oh, here's the example of handling release tasks. So in our case, we run Plone, which uses build out, kind of like a make, a super powered make tool. And then we can run and install, like for example, npm install and gulp, and then running our gulp tasks to ensure that the new CSS and JavaScript gets compiled. And it's not just for releases. We actually can do automations, for example, bringing production data back into other environments. You know, it's a one command line. Because not, it's usually not as easy as dump a database, load a database. Usually there's other artifacts that come along with that. For example, in our case, we have uh, the blob storage or the, the large files that go along with the content management system. We need to make sure those are in sync as well. And so we can manage that process all in once with uh, grabbing production data, for example. That's really small, and I don't expect anyone to be able to read that. 
I promise. Uh, but if you go look at the code online, you'll see here we're, we're not only stopping database servers, stopping the instances, dumping the databases, syncing the, the blob storages from one environment to another. Uh, there's there's you know, probably 20, 25 steps involved in getting data from one environment to another environment. Good luck getting a human to do it twice exactly the same way in a row. Luckily, Salt can do it for us that way as well. Uh, I'm going to skip through this. I talked about Cloud Custodian a bit in this talk, uh, kind of saving money and automating uh, the cloud from events. So you can actually use Cloud Custodian to do things like turn off your dev instances after hours. You can immediately save 60% or more on your AWS bill just by turning off your dev instances the other eight, you know, 18 hours of the day you're not using them. It sounds too easy, right? They're all magical uh, because I sound confident about it, right? Uh, it actually was a bumpy road. Uh, there are, again, the rules, you know, satisfying the rules for no special cases was tricky. In our case, for our application to be able to deploy it, we needed specific versions of HA proxy or we needed specific versions of helper applications like WV to do document conversion. And the Amazon Linux AMIs, they don't uh, always prepare us for the right versions of those things. So you're going to have to find either a set of distributions or maintain packaging for the versions of those applications that you would need. So when you come to the Zen, who's read the Zen and Python? Who's aware of the Zen and Python? If you're not aware of the Zen and Python, even if you are aware of the Zen and Python, I recommend to everyone, print it out, frame it, put it in your bathroom, and read it while you brush your teeth every day, especially you 1150 folks. This is a key, key thing to have in mind. But there should be one, and preferably only one, obvious way to do it, although it may not be obvious to you unless you're Dutch. Uh, so we had to find the one way to get the right versions of the applications out there for us. Uh, these are actual commit messages, I think, from Matt uh, from earlier this year or last year. So we initially tried to launch an Amazon Linux. We figured we're on Linux or on Amazon. We might as well use their version of Linux. It must be optimized for their platform. It must work better because it's Amazon Linux. Uh, well, we ended up refactoring to CentOS. We're like, well, let's stay with, we'll stay with Linux. We'll stay on CentOS. Uh, well, we ended up refactoring for FreeBSD because FreeBSD actually had the most current versions of the packages in their packaging system and was the one we're actually the most comfortable with. Uh, we were really only trying to go Linux in this case so we could kind of stay mainstream. Uh, but in the end, FreeBSD ended up being the better option for us. So other recommendations for you guys. I would recommend a continuous integration strategy so you can test your infrastructure with tools. I'd mentioned this before in the keynote that you can actually now treat your whole infrastructure as another code artifact, deploy it into your continuous integration environment, test it, uh, get feedback, you know, red, green, whether it's broken or whether it's working, and actually know before you go to release your next prod release whether things are broken. This is really important on the public cloud providers because they are an ever-shifting environment. There are things always changing out from beneath you. The documentation for AWS is notoriously always slightly out of date, and there's new things happening, and there's APIs changing. So having that CI environment available to you will help you detect those changes and breakages before it reaches your production environment. You can also create your own tools with Auto3 very easily. So for example, if you need to trace requests through the cloud, uh, going from CloudFront to ELB to your um, EC2 instances can be tricky to figure out where things are going wrong or where things are uh, you know, messing up. So we created a quick little tool for pulling out CloudFront logs and being able to query based on a, 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 there's basically headers inside each page. You can basically insert that header, search for those entries, and kind of trace it through the infrastructure to see where your requests went wrong. You know, especially with caching, it's difficult to debug when you've got uh, things that can be cached at different layers, and you're unsure whether it's actually coming back and hitting your application or not. Are we living the dream? I would say yes. I think we're definitely living the dream. Uh, we have taken a non-cloud native application and we have deployed it in a much more cloud native way. So that makes me very, very happy. Thank you very much. If you have questions, actually looks like there's a question up here. We've took, once took, we once took pride in long uptimes. <laughs> I know this for sure. Uh, we've transitioned to chasing the least uptime. Outside of serverless infrastructures, does anyone enforce a max uptime? I would never require or enforce a max uptime. Matt, what's the longest one of our servers has stayed alive? Matt was in high school, I think, when this server turned on and started working for us for years before we turned it off. Six and a half years. Uh, I'm not proud of that number. 
because that means there were six and a half years of bugs, security issues, problems. I mean, luckily the infrastructure was solid and it never, you know, nothing ever happened because of other practices that were along the way, but that's just one, another attack vector or an er another area of issue that could pop up. So I don't, I mean, I, I would not enforce max uptime. Does anyone in the room enforce max uptime? Good. Uh, again, you should not be worried. Uh, you guys have heard of uh, this company called Netflix, right? We Netflix and chill. Netflix has, Netflix has open sourced a uh, tool called the Chaos Monkey. And the Chaos Monkey is exactly that. They unleash it on their AWS and it just randomly turns off things here and there. Their environment has to be resilient so that the Chaos Monkey can hit any part of that environment and everything stays live and everyone can still watch their movies. So Salt versus other products like Shepard Terraform, that one's an easy one, mostly because Salt offers a road execution and Salt offers event-driven orchestration. The other tools don't necessarily have that. They are more specialized into configuration management or Terraform more in the management of infrastructure assets. Salt combines a lot of those pieces from both those tools plus adds in the remote execution and the, um, the event-driven bit, which is really cool. I mean, that zero MQ bus that it uses to do all of its work also allows it to respond to any messages coming from the minions back up to the master. And so a minion could be reporting some activity, you know, you know someone logged in, it can trip and actually cause something to happen in a, a completely different part of the infrastructure. Any other questions? I'm just curious, how many people use SaltStack? Do you guys use SaltStack in your company? Come talk to me. I would love to talk to you about salt well, stack. I, what do you guys use? Or are you not using a product to, to do this automation? And are you interested in learning how to use salt stack? Who's we, using Puppet? Anybody using Puppet? Ansible. Chef. Oh boy, we got a lot of people to talk to. Okay. Terraform. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, I kind of feel like Terraform's a complementary technology. Actually, we use Terraform as well. Uh, we'll, we'll. The cloud bits, because of AWS's rapidly changing APIs, have been tricky for them to keep up with in the other third-party tools, even Terraform. But Terraform seems to be the most up-to-date with all the APIs, so I recommend that for folks if you're gonna dive in and do infrastructure-related things. That's my Twitter, that's my email. I am not a hard person to find, and I love talking. So please come find me and talk to me. Thank you all.